Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. Credo a ciò che dice di Dio. 我相信圣经所说的有关我的过去、我的现在以及我的未来。I pray my Bible is the words that authorize and my river. I believe God will use His Word to speak to me and to you today. And good morning, and welcome back, Church. I trust you're doing well. I would like to get straight into the message this morning because it's it's. A big topic, though it's a very simple topic, and what I want to do is uncomplicate that topic so it stops being so big. You know, it's sad because it's one of those key topics that's become quite divisive in the church, and it shouldn't it shouldn't be so. There should be a a uniform approach to this topic, and I want to just present a systematic approach, a simple approach, and what it should do is cause you to think for yourself, begin to. Look at this topic with your own、uh, discernment. Of course, you want the Holy Spirit helping you. You don't want to have an agenda to it. You just want to understand this topic as it's intended. So, if you if you do struggle with this topic, I'd love you to email me at the church.、Um, as I was saying, it's quite a large topic. So, in the future, I'll do a, a series、um, just on this topic alone to make sure that. Everything's covered, and, and, and if you send me an email, let me know what your struggle is, what your question is, and I'll make sure it's part of that teaching series, so you don't get left with these questions and the what ifs and the whys. I want to be very clear: this is a simple topic, but a massive topic with、um, untold, unimaginable consequences. And so, if you're one of those Christians who doesn't know how to treat the whole of Scripture, now. There's a fancy theological term called antinomianism. Now, this phrase is there to define someone who believes that under the new dispensation of grace, that means that since Jesus has come, a new era has been、um, entered into, called an era of grace. Now, antinomianism teaches that now that we're in this era of grace, that any form of、uh, moral law, ethical law, religious law. Found in the Old Testament, is no longer needed because we have the Holy Spirit indwelling, and you know, we've said this、uh, prayer of dedicating our lives to God, and and somehow all those laws from the Old Testament no longer apply. It's no longer to look to the Old Testament to find out moral, moral ethical, or, or religious law. And so,、uh, again, I'm going to use Jesus' words to.、Uh, Address this topic, and of course we're doing it because we're continuing the series on the Sermon on the Mount. And if you、um, turn to Matthew chapter five, verses seventeen to twenty, you can read along with me. I'm reading from the New King James Version. You'll see it up on the screen in a second. You can read another version, but this is the New King James Version. Let's have a look at it together. This is Jesus, Matthew chapter five, verse seventeen to twenty says, "Do not think that I've come to destroy the law." All the prophets, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfil. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle by no means will pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of the commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does And teaches them, he shall be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So, what is the law that Jesus is talking about? Well, it's the Mosaic law. Mosaic means it was the law handed to Moses. In the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, we get a bit of history in Genesis, and then the formation of a a nation called Israel, and then once they're separated and set apart for God, there is this set of laws given to Moses. So the Mosaic Law. Now, we know the Mosaic Law is the law that Jesus is referring to here, but let's dig just a fraction deeper. What is the law? By that I mean, how does God describe the Mosaic Law? Well, let's turn to Hebrews chapter ten, verse one together. That says, "For the law, having a shadow of things to come, 
and not the very image of the things, can never with the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. So Hebrews says that the law, the Mosaic law, is a shadow of the things to come, a shadow of the real. The law handed to Moses is not the real law, it's the shadow of the law. So what's a shadow? So a shadow is a flat, 2D, lifeless object. It's not even alive, it's not the real thing. It only outlines, it reflects the real thing. It's not the real thing. So the law is a shadow of the real thing, and an outline, a 2D flat outline of the real thing. It's an example of, when you look at the law, you see an example, an outline of the real thing. It's not the real thing. And the law is a necessary prerequisite so that you would understand when the real thing comes, you've at least got an outline whereby to understand it because the real thing has depth. The real thing has a 3D component to it. It's able to be looked at and understood, whereas an outline is very, very simple. And so the question is this, if the Mosaic law is only a 2D outline of the real law, the real thing, what is the real law? Well, Jesus answers it quite simply. He says in Matthew chapter 22 that there's only two commandments. You must get this and understand this. There's just two commandments. The first one is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. That's the first law. That's the first great commandment. The second one is just like it, that you should love others as yourself. Now, loving God and loving others as yourself don't sound very similar to me, but what is similar is this one word, love. You see, love is the whole law. And that's what Jesus goes on to say in Matthew chapter 22, is that all the law and all the prophets hang on these two simple commandments. That means if you don't have love, you don't really have the purpose of the law. You don't really understand the law. You're just stuck with an outline. You've only got this two-dimensional outline of what is truly the law. And so here's the thing. Love is the law. Simple, right? But how? How do you teach love? How do you enforce it? That's why the law was given. The law is an outline of love. The law was given to teach men how to love. As we've just said, the two great commandments. Well, as Jesus said, the two great commandments are to love God and love others or love mankind. So love is the law. The whole law is love. Just one simple word, love. And that expands out to love God, love others, love self. Simple, right? But how do you teach that? How do you enforce that? How do you break that up into simple examples? That's right. And now you understand that's what the law was given for. Law was given so that we would learn how to love. It uses simple examples to teach us how to live right with God. It gives simple processes on how to live with each other, how to love each other. This was the purpose of the law. Now, let me ask you, if that is the purpose of the law, is the law a good or a bad thing? You need to think about it because some people will treat the law as if it's a bad thing. Now, in Romans chapter 8, 2 to 4, Paul makes it pretty clear that there was absolutely nothing wrong with the law. The law was perfect. It was doing exactly what it was meant to do. So the question is, how did it go wrong? Why did it go wrong? Why did Jesus have to come? Well, Jesus was actually the original idea. <laughs> the law was a, a foreshadowing of him. But he had to come because it says in Romans 8, chapter 2, that the law was fantastic. The law was perfect and operating just fine, except. It was weakened by the flesh. That means that there was nothing wrong with the law, but the people that were using it were weakening it. See, the law had lost its ability to do what it was meant to do, which was to teach us how to love, to teach us how to live with each other in peace, to live with each other well, to love God, to live well with God. It became all about the law, following the law. And that's where we come to the whole central issue where did it go wrong? The heart of man. 
You see, man has a tendency towards legalism, and it's that legalism that caused men to um, miss the point of the law, to miss the whole point of the law. The priests at the time were misusing the law because they're only focusing on the letter of it. They were missing the entire point of it, which was love. This next statement might take you a second to get your head around. You might want to hear it, think about it a few times. But it's incredibly profound if you stop and just <laughs> contemplate it. When the penny drops, you'll realize, man, God is so brilliant. Here's the statement. Are you ready? Rebellion and religion deliver two completely different outcomes, yet they are flawed with exactly the same origin. That is legalism. Both rebellion and religion have the same flaw is they focus on the letter of the law. And not just Mosaic law, we're talking about any law. Anybody who is rebellious is legalistic. Anybody who is religious is legalistic. Those, those who rebel are just as legalistic as those who they claim they're rebelling against. Those legalistic people, those religious people, a rebel is just as bad as the religious type, maybe even worse in some cases. So here's the question. Which are you? Are you, do you have a rebellious tendency? Do you have a religious tendency? Ask this question of yourself. Let's imagine, for example, um, you live in a street where the speed limit is um, 70 kilometers. And then... One day they pop up these new signs saying the whole thing has been dropped down to 50 kilometres. Now that would be inconvenient because we live <laughs> by routine and we, we know how long it takes us to get through our suburbs because of the speed limits. And so here's the thing. If you're rebellious, you see the new speed limit and the first thing that pops up is, oh, how ridiculous, it's going to take forever to get to work, I'm not doing this. And so you rebel. Why? because you have a legalistic approach. You have a legalistic uh, understanding. You just see the letter of the law, the new speed sign, and you react to it, which is rebellion. And of course, the other one is a religious person. A religious person follows the letter of the law. You see the sign go up 70 k's and you immediately go, oh, I better slow down. I better obey that. That's the new speed limit. And so they both have completely different outcomes. One will look for every opportunity to break the law. One will look at every opportunity to um, obey the law. But here's the point. What we want to be is the sort of person that has a revelation, a revelatory sort of person that looks at the new speed limit and says, I wonder what they're trying to achieve with that new speed limit. I wonder why they've enforced that new speed limit here. It's not about rebelling against it. It's not about mindlessly obeying it. There is something about the person that contemplates the whys, that has a greater revelation, that has a greater understanding of the law. Now, let's get back. Forget your speed limits for a second. Let's get back to the law. How does the law work? How, how does it do that? Well, what it does is it tries to capture the spirit of the law and then it just puts it down in a letter of the law, in a written form, to act as an example, as an outline. You see, that new speed limit is meant to make us think about the safety that we're traveling on the roads. Then it's not, the focus is not, not meant to be on the new speed limit, it's meant to be on safety. But they have to change the speed sign, that the, the speed limit sign, in order to reinforce that these speed limits are about safety. You get it? And so too with the Mosaic Law. These things were given to teach us, the whole law and all the prophets were given to teach us godly principles. And how we react to those principles doesn't determine whether the law is good or bad. What it does is reveal what's in us. It, if, if our reaction is to rebel against it and say, what a stupid law. Well, that reveals you, not whether the law is stupid. If you obey it mindlessly without any understanding, that reveals you, not the law. But if you stop and see the law of the Lord, if you see the Mosaic law and you read it and you, you ask for understanding, you want to seek to understand what this is about, then you will gain discernment. Look, when my tail was in about grade five, 
she was doing fractions at school. Now she's a smart kid, but she struggled understanding the principle of fractions. And so I sat her at the kitchen bench and I pulled out an orange and I was trying to explain the orange, using the orange as a whole. And I said, how many oranges are in my hand? And, I, and she says, one orange. And I said, now if, if I chop it up, how many oranges am I gonna have? And she goes, four. And I said, no, I'm not gonna have four oranges. I'm still gonna have one orange. I said, so I went to the fridge and I grabbed four oranges. And I said, here's four oranges, not one orange. So I moved the other three aside and I grabbed the knife and I chopped one orange twice. And I had four parts. So I said, how many parts do I have? And she goes, you've got four parts. And then I pushed them all back together. And I said, how many oranges do I have? And she said, one. And so she got the principle of fractions by taking an orange. The example was the orange chopped up and she understood, oh, an orange can be made up of four parts. Now, I know it's a simple example. And I don't want to be insulting it at all, but I want you to get it. The thing is this, if Taya is legalistic, which thank God she's not, but if Taya was legalistic in this approach, here's what would happen. The law of fractions would be lost on her because it would be limited to oranges or quarters. She wouldn't be able to apply the principle of fractions outside of oranges, or she wouldn't be able to apply the principle of fractions outside of quarters because that's all that was demonstrated to her. And she didn't have the capacity to understand that what this was a simple example of fractions. But if she understands the principle of fractions, it applies outside of oranges, it applies outside of quarters, it applies anywhere where fractions are required. Do you get it? And this was the reason that the priesthood had to be removed because they had limited the law of love to what was written and they could not apply it to anything other than quarters and oranges. Do you understand what I mean by that? It was all about the law instead of about the law liberating us to learn how to love God, love man, and love ourselves. It limited us in our love of God and our love of others. Why don't you turn with me to 1 Peter 2, 15 to 16. I'm just going to take a couple of verses here and then we'll move on. 1 Peter 2, verse 15 and 16 says, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to shame the ignorance of foolish men as free yet not using, so he's talking about you, you are free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Isn't that a fantastic verse? Now turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. For you, brethren, were called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Did you catch the thread there? Did you catch the thread? You and I are called to liberty, and not liberty from the law, but liberty to fulfill the law. Now with fresh eyes, let's have a look at what Jesus is saying here in our original text in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through to 20. Verse 17, Jesus says, do not think that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. Now, Jesus, knowing full well how uh, humanity's legalistic tendency, legalistic bent would make them uh, either rebel or be religious, no matter what he said, no matter, no matter what he did, they would misrepresent, or misinterpret and misrepresent him. And so he states very clearly what he has not come to do and what he has come to do. Don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets, for I've not come to abolish the law and the prophets. And he finishes off by saying, I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Now, I understand we all speak English and <laughs> that's okay. Here's the problem with the English language is it uses the word fulfilled. Now, if you go to the Greek, the Greek word is actually pleiro, which is a far better translation as satisfied. Now, you might think fulfilled, satisfied. Yeah, I sure, I'm okay with that. Uh, but it means to actually accomplish or, or someone who uh, executes an office. Does that make sense? Now, let's move to verse 18. We see the word fulfilled again. He says, 
nothing will pass away. Nothing will pass away. In fact, in Luke's accounts, Jesus says it would be easier for the world to pass away than for the law and the prophets to pass away. So he says, nothing's going to pass away until all is fulfilled. Now, this is a completely different Greek word. This is genomahi. And this actually means to complete something, to, um, to finish it off. Now, you might think, you know, these two Greek words, are that difference. It's kind of like if I was to say, I'm going to make something, I'm going to bake something. Now, they sound similar. They have a rhyme to them and you can interchange them to some extent. But you don't make a cake, you bake a cake. And there are times when you, words are used specifically because it doesn't, the application is not appropriate, it's not accurate. And the problem with using the word fulfilled and fulfilled twice here is you're missing, you can really, really miss the point. He has not come to uh, finish off everything. That will happen in due time because we live in a world where not all has been fulfilled, right? Not all the law has been fulfilled. Not all the prophets have been fulfilled. And therefore, when Jesus says, I haven't come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill it, is this righteous component, this part of the law that Jesus has come to fulfill, has been fulfilled in him. That is that he has fulfilled the law. He has answered the call of the law to live righteously. Okay, let's keep moving. Verse 18 says, Jesus makes it very, very clear what it means to abolish the law. He doesn't leave it up in the air for interpretation. He makes it very clear. Now listen, this is what he says. If anybody breaks the law or teaches men to do so, they are the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, don't argue with them. Don't correct them. Just walk away. They're fools because a fool can't be corrected. The fool won't be corrected. Foolishness has nothing to do with education or intellectual capacity. It has to do with heart capacity. These people won't be corrected. They won't listen to good, sound, biblical advice. Just walk away from them. And so anyone who breaks the law and encourages people to do so should be avoided. They're the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, what does an antinomianist believe? Well, listen to this. It's a person who professes that faith in Jesus Christ, a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, has no obligation to know how God wants us to live and to fulfill how God wants us to live. That person believes that Jesus has abolished the law. An antinomianist believes that the Jewish law, the Mosaic law, was written for Jews or to Jews and only applies to Jews. That person believes that Jesus came to abolish the law. An antinomianist believes that God's expectation of us is a righteous life. Remember, he says, be holy as I am holy. So God expects us to live a righteous life, yet he's removed the, the one clear written code by which we can measure it, by which we can outline, by which we can test. Am I living right with God? Am I living right with others? Am I living right with myself? Am I loving God? Am I loving others? Am I loving myself the way I'm meant to do? You see, that person believes that Jesus came to do exactly what he said he did not come to do, which was abolish the law. And Jesus finishes off this thought by saying, unless your righteousness is greater than the righteousness of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So your righteousness, I mean, as a Christian, we go, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in Jesus' righteousness. Jesus came to make me righteous. Now, that is true, absolutely true. If you think anybody else makes you righteous, <laughs> you're in trouble. If you think you can make yourself right with God, you're in real trouble. So we accept the righteousness of Jesus Christ at, when we're born again. But there is a continuation of that righteousness. There is a, a, a command and um, a requirement and obligation for us to continue maintain that level of righteousness that's been handed to us so generously. So the law is given to us to teach us how to live right with God, right? The law is given to us to teach us how to live right with others and ourselves. The law is given so that we can love God and love others. Fulfill the law. You see, through Jesus Christ's righteousness being imputed to us and through the Holy Spirit being imparted to us, we now have the ability to fulfill the law. You and I are not hopelessly lost sinners. Yes, we sin from time to time, but with the 
imputation of Jesus' righteousness and the impartation of the Holy Spirit, we are liberated not from the law, we are liberated to fulfill the law. Yeah, the Spirit of the law is not disregarding. The Spirit of the law does not dissolve. The Spirit of the law does not remove the law. It simply gives us the ability to fulfill it. Have a look at Romans 3, verse 21 to 22 with me. It says, For now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. I understand what this is saying. Please understand this is talking about the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. This is the revelation of Jesus and the law of love was revealed through Jesus and in Jesus. Ready? Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all on whom believe. When Jesus came, not one jot, not one tittle of the law has been removed, abolished, diminished, watered down or destroyed. Listen, through Jesus coming, the law and the prophets bear witness to the righteousness of God, the law of love. That's what they bear testament to. When Jesus came, the law and the prophets aligned with Jesus. Jesus wasn't subject to the law and the prophets. They were subject to him because he's the real deal and they are the shadow of or the foretelling of the real thing, which is love, the personification of love in Jesus. When Jesus came, the Bible tells us that we know that God loved us because he sent his son. Jesus is the personification, the demonstration of love. Let's quickly look at 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says, For he made him, so the Father made the Son, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Friend, you and I are the demonstration of God's righteousness. Now let's read that one more time together because if you've, if you've overread this, I pray God gives you a revelation right now. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, For he who made him, the Father made the Son, the one who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You and I are the demonstration of love. Now, when you look around our churches, you've got to ask yourself a question. Observe the way we treat each other and say, has the law been fulfilled in us? Are we fulfilling the law? Are we loving God the way we're meant to be loving God? Are we loving each other the way we're meant to be loving each other? Are we loving ourselves the way we're meant to be loving ourselves? Would the, the world look at us and say, these people truly are the righteousness of God. These people truly know how to love God, love each other and love themselves. I think we'd all agree the answer is no. I'm afraid the law still has a lot to teach us. And I think one of the reasons that the world justifiably has a disdain for the church is because of our behavior towards each other. And that's because of our approach to the law. The law sits there, unread, teaching us how to love God and love man, or love others and love ourselves. Yet we don't read it because of an antinomian thinking pattern that says, we don't need the law. We've all said our wonderful prayer and we are born again believers. You might be a wonderful born again believer, but are you fulfilling the law? Would the world look at our lives and say, they are well and truly the righteousness of God. There is no question that love is in them. They are the demonstration of love. There's no power in professing a faith in Jesus Christ if that profession in Jesus Christ has absolutely no direct impact on our life. If that profession of faith in Jesus Christ has no impact on our love for God. If that profession of faith has no impact on the way we love others and ourselves. So how do we as New Testament born again believers approach the Old Testament? Well, James 1.25 says, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, 
and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in all that he does. What I'm asking you to do, what I'm challenging you to do, if you're a born-again believer out there today, I'm asking you to read the Old Testament. Now, not read the law for the sake of being able to recite the law or mindlessly follow the law. I want you to read the law with the purpose of understanding the spirit of the law. One of the problems that we have to face is the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. This is not the Holy Spirit of the law versus the letter of the law because you're pitting the writer of the law against his own law. Yes, we know the Holy Spirit was inspiration in David's Psalms. The Holy Spirit was the wisdom in King Solomon. The Holy Spirit was the guider of so many issues in history. The Holy Spirit was truly the muse behind Psalms. The Holy Spirit was the one who penned with Moses the law. So you can't, you can't interpret the spirit of the law as being the Holy Spirit versus the letter of the law. That would be absolutely unsensible. It would absolutely be illogical. So the letter of the law that we read about is the spirit of the law, the intention of the law. What was the law written for versus the letter of the law? What is the real thing versus the letter? And if we only look at the letter, we will miss So here's what I'm asking you to do, Christian. What I'm challenging you to do is read the Old Testament. Read the law. And not just read the letter of it, but seek to understand it. Now, be on guard for legalism. It'll pop up more than you can imagine. I mean, now that you're aware of it, you might be surprised at how legalistic you really are. Now, remember what it's like. The two apparent different outworkings of legalism are rebellion and religion. You'll either read this, these laws and say, oh, how stupid, how stupid. Or you'll read it and go, oh, shivers, I've broken the law. I better do something about it. Listen, I'm not asking you to do either of those things. I'm asking you to be aware of it. And if you see legalism pop up in you, immediately acknowledge it and immediately repent of it. We don't want legalism. What we want is for you to follow the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. When you read something, I want you to be aware the Holy Spirit is indwelling you and should be available for you to at any point in time say, Oh God, I don't understand what I'm reading when you give me a revelation. I want to understand what you're trying to teach me here. I want to understand the principle of the law. Don't think the law will make you righteous. I mean, you can study it. Uh, history has shown that some people get very involved in studying the law. The more you study the law and the letter of the law, the more legalistic you will become, the more rebellious you will become, or the more self-righteous and religious you will become. Don't become either of those. The more you study the law, the more your spirit should be coming alive, learning new godly principles about how to love God, about how to love others, and love yourself as we were intended to do. The law will not make you righteous. It will never do that. Jesus alone makes you righteous. But the law will give you examples that might seem out of date, that might seem currently invalid and hard to apply. Some of the laws might absolutely make no sense to you whatsoever. Will you please use the opportunity when any of these things happen to pray, God, I need a revelation on this principle of love. Jesus is the fulfillment of love. And you're saying, I want to fulfill the law of love as Jesus did. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's not enough to say, well, he lived righteously and I'm just going to keep applying his righteousness to my life. Every time I fall down, I'm going to repent. You can stop falling down if you study the law. You can stop having to repent 200 times a day because you can't seem to get it right. Study the law and understand the letter of it is only going to bring you bondage. Use the letter of the law to inspire a prayer of revelation. Oh God, I want to understand what is the spirit of this law. Friends, what an amazing privilege that we have in our hands. The unchanged and unchanging, the unchangeable wisdom and laws of God. 
Now, the applications will be different today than they were thousands of years ago. I'm not asking you to apply the law. I'm asking you to understand the spirit of the law, because if you follow the spirit of the law, the letter can make sense. The letter can be a healthy outline, but you can actually appear to be breaking the letter of the law, but fulfilling the spirit of the law. So church, I think it's time we, you and I, acknowledge our tendency towards legalism, that rebellious expression or that religious expression. It's all legalism. It's all following the letter of the law. It's, it's all our reaction to the letter of the law. We're not called to that. Jesus called us free. We are free. And so um, James 2 verse 8 says, that if you are to fulfill the royal law as according to scripture, you will love your neighbor as yourself and you do well. So church, I pray this week for you, you do well. You love your neighbor as yourself and you love God as according to the Holy Scriptures. Let me pray for you. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you for the work that you're doing in this people today, even the work that you've begun to stir up, not just an awareness that the Old Testament is there and still useful, but Lord, they have a passion begin to stir up inside them to seek out truth, not follow the letter of the law, but to study and to wait on you to find out what the spirit of the law is actually saying to them. So Lord, I ask for discernment, discretion, wisdom, and patience to hear you. And so Lord, I bless them. In your name, amen. So church, let me finish with this simple little benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be merciful to you. May he lift his countenance towards you and bring you peace. And may the name of the Lord be upon you and all who see you see the blessing of the Lord on your life. And may your life draw others to God. So I bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Do well this week. Bless you. Till next week. Amen.